The Peter Schiff Show. I want to talk a little bit about the complacency with which most Wall Street observers, strategists, investors are um, exhibiting when they discuss and contemplate the world of $50 oil or $40 oil and how everybody just accepts the fact that it's a universal positive for the U.S. economy. After all, lower prices have got to be good, right, because people can pay less money for gas. Of course, these are the same people who tell us that deflation is bad. So try to square that circle. But listen to this interview that I heard this morning on CNBC with Kevin O'Leary. We have a little uh, snippet from it. And some of you may know Kevin O'Leary as being one of the more vocal sharks in the TV show Shark Tank. Uh, But here's Kevin, uh, you know, very, very happy to see the price of oil going down, hopes it goes down. In fact, he says he hopes it goes down to, what, $40 a barrel and and stays there. If you could choose between two oil prices for 2015 as an S&P investor, which is what I am, $100 or 40, forgetting about all of the noise around it, which would you prefer for this economy? Which would you prefer? Doesn't it matter what names you currently hold? Okay, Carl, 20% of the names in the S&P are somehow associated with the transportation or exclusion of oil. Those guys are toast, okay? What about the other 80% that benefit from the low input cost of oil? If you just stay diversified with no more than 20% in energy in your portfolio, you're loving a $40 oil price. I want to see oil at 30 bucks. This is a wonderful thing for the economy, and I personally hope that oil get, goes to 35 bucks and stays there. Well, there's a lot of things that Kevin and other people are overlooking. Let's say that he is right. Let's say that oil prices do go down to $40 a barrel or maybe $30 a barrel. Who knows? They went to 30 in 2008, right? So maybe they do that again. Maybe they go down there and maybe they stay there. Yes, for some Americans, clearly, it's a good thing, right? Because they get to pay uh, lower prices for gasoline. But let's look at the whole picture, because if that really happens, that means that the entire energy boom, the shale revolution that everybody's been talking about is going to be our savior. Oh, Peter, people would tell me you're totally wrong. You don't have to worry about America. These trade deficits are going to go away because we're going to be the next Saudi Arabia. We're going to be exporting all this oil and this is going to be the boom. Well, at $40 a barrel, we ain't going to export any oil. We're going to be importing more oil than ever before because we're not going to be able to produce oil at 30 to 40 dollars a barrel yeah there are some wells that might be able to operate at that uh price level but not many and here's what kevin and everybody else all these pollyannas on oil here's one of the many points that they're overlooking if they're right and oil prices do go down that means that all the capital investment in the oil sector over the past few years all of the hiring it's all been a bubble right it was all based on the false belief that 80 to $100 a barrel oil was here to stay. If it turns out that that was wrong, that that was a mania, and of course, one of the reasons for the mania was the Fed, all the cheap money that helped push up oil prices. There's no accident that oil prices are now dropping as the Fed is ending QE and threatening to raise interest rates next year. And so the air is coming out of this real oil bubble, right? Because the Fed is threatening to prick it, right? And so if it was a bubble and all this investment was malinvestment, what are the implications for the U.S. economy when that bubble burst? Well, what happened when the NASDAQ bubble burst in 2000? We had a recession. When that bubble burst, why should this be any different? Especially when this is bigger I think in relation to the economy, I don't have all the data. I'm going to try to do a little research on this. But I think as far as total employment, certainly far fewer people were employed by dot-com companies in 1999 than were employed in the oil industry right now. In fact, all the real job growth, the decent jobs, the few decent jobs we've created, they've been in the energy sector. So if that turns out to be a bubble, malinvestment, and we have to lay all these people off, that's going to have a big impact on the economy. Sure, some consumers might save $10 a month on their gasoline, 
but how many consumers are going to lose their entire paycheck? You know, what are, people are worrying about, oh, they're going to, that's going to free up extra money for consumers to spend. Maybe they'll spend it. Maybe they'll pay off uh, some of their student loans, or maybe they'll uh, pay down their credit card debt, or maybe they need it to pay the higher cost of health care. I don't know how big a boom for the economy is going to be at this point. Uh, but what about the impact of all these people who had 80, 90, $100,000 a year jobs who are now laid off? What happens to their spending? Right. But also, what about the capital investment? A lot of the dot coms were funded by selling stock. They didn't borrow a lot of money from banks, although there was a lot of vendor financing going on in the dot com bubble. There wasn't that much bank financing. There was a lot of debt that financed oil drilling in the United States. A lot of banks have loaned a lot of money to a lot of companies. And if oil prices go to 30 or 40 dollars a barrel and stay there like Kevin O'Leary is hoping for, a lot of these loans are going to go into default. And what is that going to mean? That means some banks might actually fail as a result of bad oil loans. And that means credit has to contract because if they've lost their money loaning it out to oil companies, they got to call in their other loans. They can't extend other forms of credit when they've blown up their balance sheets. Right. And what about uh, investors who have lost a bunch of money in the oil sector? A lot of people were buying oil investments for income. All that income is going to dry up. So that's money that can't be spent. So this is, I think, a much bigger deal for the economy than the NASDAQ bubble. And the NASDAQ bubble burst and we had a recession. And what did the Federal Reserve do? They lowered interest rates down to 1% from 5 or 6%. Well, if this real oil bubble turns out to be a bubble, can the Fed lower interest rates to help the economy? No, they're already at zero. There's nothing they can do. Now, you might argue, well, September 11th happened and that exacerbated the downturn. I think we were going to have a recession even without September 11th, just based on the reallocation of malinvested resources in the aftermath of the dot-com bubble bursting. But this is a bigger bubble. It involves more employees, more capital, more loans, and the fallout is going to be bigger. And to say, well, it's all going to be mitigated based on $40 oil, well, oil was a lot lower than $40 in 2000. I think it was around $14 a barrel. Yet that didn't stop us from having a recession. Hey, oil prices went down to $30 a barrel in 2008. You know, that didn't stop the recession. It happened anyway. Right? Where was all the relief from cheap oil? Why didn't that cheap oil keep us out of a recession? Because um, oil prices weren't dropping in a vacuum. Nor do I believe they are dropping in a vacuum now. See, here's another thing that nobody is thinking about. If it turns out that oil was a bubble fueled in large part by the cheap money provided by the Fed, why should we think that oil is the only bubble? In fact, I think that there are many. I think that the Fed's monetary policy has inflated bubbles in the stock market, the real estate market, the bond market. Who's to say that the oil bubble is the only one that's going to pop? I just think it's the first one. They're going to go like dominoes, just like they did in 2008. It wasn't just oil prices crashing. It was real estate, right? It was stocks. At the, the bond market didn't crash in 2008 because I guess the bond bubble wasn't as enormous as it is today. But that's another bubble that is long overdue for crashing. So if all these bubbles crash, is cheap oil going to be our salvation or get out of jail free card? No. And of course, a lot of things have changed since the last time oil was 30 or 40 dollars a barrel, right? Healthcare costs are a lot more expensive. Food costs are a lot more expensive. So just because Americans are saving a little money on their gasoline, it doesn't mean that they haven't lost it by having other things that are more expensive. Plus, I think we have a much smaller labor force. Far fewer people have jobs now. Uh, as a percentage of the economy. So there's not as many people that are commuting back and forth to work. So the savings in that respect won't be as big as it was. But I mean, think about this. There, people are going to say, well, you know, falling oil prices are good because consumers can buy oil cheaper. Well, you could have said the same thing about houses, right? Falling real estate prices were good. It's a good thing that real estate prices fell in 2008 because that was good for consumers of houses. That meant people that wanted to buy a house can buy it cheaper. Same thing with oil. But that overlooks the impact on people who borrowed a bunch of money to overpay for houses. Or in this current environment, companies that borrowed a lot of money to drill for oil based on the assumption that oil prices would stay high. You see, a lot of homeowners levered up and a lot of banks extended credit 
based on the belief that real estate prices would never fall. Well, you could say the same thing about the oil market. A lot of people borrowed a lot of money and a lot of banks or individuals loaned a lot of money based on the expectation of 80, 90, hundred dollar oil. If it's 30 or $40 a barrel, right? Well, then it turns out that they were mistaken, just like people in the real estate market. But when real estate prices came down, was that just a benefit because it meant people could buy houses cheaper? No, it was a disaster based on all the bad decisions made with borrowed money from people who expected higher prices. Well, yes, it's going to be a benefit to some people that they could buy oil cheaper. But a lot of people are going to suffer based on the malinvestments that were made on the expectation of higher oil prices, the layoffs, the bankruptcies, the, the you know, all the, the all of that. And now what is the government going to do? Right. If the uh, ha- uh, oil boom turned out to have been a bubble and now the boom is bust, even if it doesn't mean that we're going to have a collapse in the other markets, which I think is coming, right? Even if it's not the stock market, the real estate market, let's say it is contained, right? Those famous words, you know, the crisis is contained, not to subprime, but to oil, right? It's an oil crisis. Even if that's the only bubble that bursts, that in and of itself is enough to tip the economy into recession. Now, what is the Federal Reserve going to do if the collapsing oil price results in big layoffs, bankruptcies, uh, and a recession. Well, they're going to call off the rate hikes, and they're going to launch QE4. And then the price of oil is going to go right back up, just like it did in 2008. Oil collapsed from $150 a barrel to 30 and then it turned on a dime when the Fed launched QE. Why does anybody expect it would be any different this time? It wouldn't, unless, of course, the Fed doesn't do the QE the way it did it in 2008. But why wouldn't it? Because this will bring about a recession, just like the bursting of the the dot-com bubble did and the housing bubble. And again, I believe that if the Fed doesn't do QE4 to save the economy from this recession, and it may very well do it before oil gets down that low or before we start to see all the big layoffs. But even if it waits for that to happen and then it has to come you know, late to the party, late to the game uh, with the alcohol to bail everybody out, if they don't do it, again, it's not just going to be oil prices that, that collapse because these other markets, the stock market, the real estate market are also propped up based on cheap money. And if Janet Yellen follows through with what everybody thinks she's going to do, which is start raising interest rates sometime next year and keep on raising them until they're back to normal. And if she does what she said she was going to do before Congress, unwinds the balance sheet, lets all the government bonds mature that they're holding and shrinks that four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet back down to a trillion. If all that were to happen, and that would be the tightest monetary policy in U.S. history. It'd be the first time ever that the Federal Reserve shrank its balance sheet. So far, it's only expanded. It's never contracted. So this would be entering into uncharted waters. I find it hard to believe that the oil market is the only one in isolation, right? the only market that is not going to be impacted. The oil market wouldn't have been the only market that was propped up based on cheap money. And since it wasn't the only asset to be propped up, it's not going to be the only asset to collapse without it. So again, for people who are looking at oil prices and thinking this is great, they better think again. They better realize that this is not going to be contained. I mean, it's as contained as much as the mortgage crisis was contained to subprime. Now, again, the only reason that I don't think oil is going to go down to 30 or $40 a barrel and stay there is because I don't believe the Fed is going to let it happen. They're not going to allow that recession. They're going to do the only thing they can do to stop it. And that is unleash, right, a tidal wave of new money in QE4, which is going to be bigger, I think, than QE1, 2, and 3 combined. The effect of that is going to be to reverse the decline in oil prices. It's also going to reverse the rally in the dollar. The dollar, I believe, will tank. And as the dollar tanks, that will help bring down oil prices in other countries where the currencies are rising against the dollar. And that will fuel new demand for oil coming from abroad. And I think that will ultimately validate all the investments that were made in the oil sector because the Fed is not going to do what everybody thinks it's going to do. But that just shows you how crazy people are, that they can hold these views and not understand that they're diametrically opposed. You can't believe 
that the Fed is actually going to tighten and shrink its balance sheet and not think we're going into a recession, not think these asset bubbles are going to collapse. And of course, once you come to that conclusion that, well, if the Fed tightens, they burst the bubble, not just in oil, but in stocks, bonds, and real estate, and we then have a financial crisis worse than 2008, because if banks are losing money, not just based on bad oil loans, but based on bad real estate loans, and if all these stock markets, all these companies that have levered up, right, they borrowed so much money to buy back their own stock, and then the stock market goes down and interest rates go up, and we have a wave of corporate bankruptcies, and now they've also blown up their pensions, right, and we have all these disasters, uh, how is the Fed not going to do another round of QE? How is Janet Yellen, the most dovest Fed chairman of them all, going to be the only one to do the right thing, going to be the only one to administer the tough love, the sound money? She's going to be the lone hawk, right? She's going to do what Bernanke and Greenspan failed to do, right? Not on your, not on your life, not a chance. Because, I, again, I think that Greenspan had to hold his nose to do what he did. I think Greenspan knew better. He knew his policies were then a disaster. He just didn't care. He just hoped that he would get out of Dodge before it hit the fan, and he just wanted to be popular. And now if you look at or listen to what Greenspan is saying, he's admitting that the policies didn't work, and he's advising people to buy gold. Well, you know, a little late, but I guess better late than never. But he ought to know how hot this fire is going to burn because he lit the matches. But the problem is Janet Yellen doesn't know. She actually thinks... Her policies are going to work. Alan Greenspan knew they weren't going to work, but he did them anyway because he just knew it would delay the inevitable. Uh, uh, Janet Yellen doesn't have that kind of economic understanding. She is completely schooled in Keynesianism. She doesn't have an Austrian free market hard money roots. Right? Uh, she's just a product of our liberal Keynesian educational establishment, and so she's completely brainwashed. She has no idea. Uh, what she's going to do. I think I've used the analogy. She's going to be like a kid in a, with, a, with, a, with a chemistry set who's just throwing all kinds of chemicals together, has no idea how they're going to interact, and she's going to end up blowing us up, except all she has is a printing press, and she'll print it and print it and print it until she blows up the dollar because that's the only way this can end. Right? Either we let all these bubbles deflate, and again, oil won't turn out to be the only bubble if the Fed tightens. There are bigger bubbles believe me, in the stock market, in the housing market, in the bond market, than the oil one. The oil one is just maybe the most vulnerable, so it's the earliest to pop. But it isn't, by any stretch of the imagination, the biggest of the bubbles. But probably the biggest bubble of all may in fact be in the dollar. Because in order to avoid popping all the other bubbles, because they're too big to pop, right? they have to pop the one bubble in the dollar. right? Because they, they can prop up real estate prices, they can prop up oil prices, they can prop up bond prices, they can prop up stock prices, but the only way they can do that is by printing dollars. But then they can't prop up the dollar, right? So eventually the dollar has to give way, and I think that's the sacrifice that they're willing to make. They sacrifice the dollar to save everything else, and of course, that's like making a deal with the devil, because you end up selling your soul, and you, it's gonna be the worst of all. I think ultimately for the economy, the worst thing that can happen is that the dollar bubble bursts. <clears throat> but unfortunately, because of political expediency, I think that's the most likely bubble to burst. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies.